This program contains language that may be unsuitable for children. Goldman Sachs is very, very good at what they do. Almost everybody at Goldman Sachs worked weekends, and almost everybody at Goldman Sachs worked nights. I was too busy working to, to have much socializing. We were trained to be like client kamikazes. We had a kill for the client. It's clearly a culture that cultivates ruthlessness. Remember, for Goldman to be winners, there had to be losers. And as we know now, there were thousands and thousands of losers. Goldman Sachs, you're the worst. Time to put the people first. Millions of Americans have lost their jobs, their homes. In the last three years, we've knocked down over 500 homes in this neighborhood alone. They have crashed the national economy. We wouldn't be here but for the fact that there was such a collapse in the housing market. We aren't perfect. To think that we're being charged with fraud of all things. This record-setting penalty reflects the egregiousness of Goldman's misconduct. I don't think that businesses like Goldman Sachs ought to be engaged in conflicts of interest. It's that clear. It's not whether a conflict of interest exists that is important. It's how you deal with it. In the face of a lot of noise that has gone on, we've stayed the course. The concentration of power in the hands of Goldman Sachs is even greater than it was before. There is disproportionate representation in domestic policy by people who are within the golden sphere of influence. They are aggressive. They are a potent competitor, but I think they stay within the lines. They have got the most formidable internal culture of commitment and teamwork of any organization in finance in the history of the world. Our most important assets are our people, our clients, and our reputation. The reputation is the most difficult to restore. Our clients' trust is essential to us. It is why we're as successful a firm as we are and have been for 140 years. Near the tip of Lower Manhattan, a stone's throw from the Hudson River, stands a 43-story tower of glass and steel. It's Goldman Sachs' new $2 billion headquarters, and it serves as a symbol of the bank's success. That success and what's behind it is being questioned like never before. Today, Goldman finds itself the poster child of Wall Street excess. The firm paid half a billion dollars to settle fraud charges brought by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And when it comes to public perception, an NBC News Wall Street Journal poll taken shortly before that settlement found Goldman Sachs' approval rating was worse than BP's in the midst of the Gulf oil spill. I'm David Faber. In the next hour, we'll explore how Wall Street's most profitable and powerful bank has found itself the subject of both professional admiration and public scorn. April 27, 2010. A dramatic confrontation between Washington and Wall Street. The scene, the Senate's permanent subcommittee on investigations. Goldman Sachs's highest ranking executives are being grilled about whether the firm profited at the expense of its own clients during Wall Street's financial crisis. It's a low point in the long history of America's most storied investment bank. Good morning, everybody. Today. Committee Chairman Senator Carl Levin of Michigan doesn't mince words when confronting Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein. He shouldn't be selling junk. You shouldn't be selling crap. You shouldn't be betting against your own customer at the same time you're selling to them. Following a long investigation, Senator Levin claimed Goldman Sachs lured its clients into billions of dollars worth of deals the bank knew were likely to go bad. Look what your sales team was saying about Timberwolf. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. I, I didn't say that. Who did? Your people, internally. Come on, Mr. Sparks. Well, Mr. Chairman. Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell a shitty deal? You use the word shitty a lot of times on national television. I'm telling you, that was quoting Goldman. They were describing something internally to themselves as crap and selling it to customers. They didn't seem to be troubled by it. They say to us, you guys sitting up there don't understand the way Wall Street works. Well, let me tell you, I do understand the way Wall Street works, and that part of it is totally unacceptable, I believe reprehensible, 
and needs to be reformed. Well, they think they did right by their shareholders, who, by the way, also include their 33, 35,000 employees. They think they were actually the firm that best navigated the worst financial crisis this country's seen since the 1930s. Well, maybe there's 35,000 uh, employees or shareholders uh, that benefited, but there's uh, 200 million Americans that lost. In the hearing, CEO Blankfein defended his bank's treatment of clients when it sold them securities in the housing market. You are betting against the very security that you're selling to them. You don't disclose that. I don't think our clients care or they should care. That you what are betting against are. the security you're selling to them? And you don't think that's relevant to a client? The people who were coming to us for risk in the housing market wanted to have a security that gave them exposure to the housing market, and that's what they got. The unfortunate thing is that the housing market went south very quickly, and so people lost money in it. After every major financial crisis, it's the winners who really get the heat, not the people who've wiped out. Professor Neil Ferguson is a financial historian at Harvard. He's written extensively about the role Wall Street's banks played in the financial crisis. Do you believe that Goldman Sachs and other investment banks know they're operating within the law, but outside the boundaries of what an average person would consider to be ethical? We mustn't fall into the trap of saying in the wake of a financial crisis, this has happened because the bankers are bad people. They've actually knowingly behaved badly. Uh, it's not really been the consequence of, of moral depravity. It's been the consequence of excessive complexity, of herd behavior, and not just by a few bankers, but by a whole electronic horde of investors, including, frankly, us. Nonetheless, for many, the hearing crystallized a lingering suspicion that Wall Street's leading firm somehow gamed the system to ensure it would emerge from the financial meltdown relatively unscathed. In 2009, less than a year after it received a $10 billion bailout from the government, Goldman made $13 billion in profits, cementing its standing atop Wall Street. The firm's history and unique corporate culture help explain both its success and the reasons why it's come under such widespread criticism. Goldman's rise in power and prestige begins not with its founding in 1869 by Marcus Goldman, but with, of all people, a high school dropout from Brooklyn. The year was 1956. Don Larson pitched a perfect game in the World Series. Grace Kelly became a princess. And five foot four Sidney Weinberg became the biggest man on Wall Street. As Goldman Sachs' senior partner, Weinberg had masterminded the largest stock offering in history when the Ford Motor Company went public. It was the biggest deal that Wall Street had ever seen. And of course, coming after the Second World War and the Depression, it was all the more important a deal. Charles Ellis, a longtime consultant to the firm, is the author of The Partnership, The Making of Goldman Sachs. He says Weinberg's personality was the key to his rise from janitor's assistant to corporate titan. So how does a guy with, what, a seventh grade education have the, have the acumen that at the end of the day, I think he served on more boards of directors than probably anybody in the history of corporate finance. He had a tremendous capacity for connectivity with other people. It was impossible to not like being with Sidney Weinberg. Long before anyone had heard of networking, Weinberg was practicing it. Even the executive in chief called on him for advice. Well, you're very kind to call me, Mr. President. I'm at your disposal well, any time. I want you to give me some suggestions and ideas and come in and, and try to help me because no you. one man can do this by himself. I will give you everything I got. But within Goldman Sachs, there was some concern about its savior. Former Chairman John Whitehead was once Sidney Weinberg's assistant. He was getting older, and I recognized that nearly 100% of the business that Goldman Sachs did was his business, where he had the contacts with the company. And what would happen to Goldman Sachs after that? Whitehead, not even a partner at the time, proposed the unheard of, a unit that would actually go out and solicit new business. Calling on companies was not something that was done in investment banking circles. The companies came to see your firm. 
The new idea was a success. Goldman added scores of clients and established a new industry standard. Sidney was able to retire graciously, and we didn't lose a single one of his clients. Now, did he ever come to you and say, you know what, Whitehead, that was a good idea? Never did. <laughs> Never did. When Weinberg died in 1969, he was succeeded as senior partner by Gus Levy, who gained a reputation as the hardest working man on Wall Street. He soon had all of Goldman Sachs working just as hard. I retired because I really wanted to manage money. And Hedge fund pioneer Leon Cooperman that, so started his career at Goldman money. working for Levy. Yes, the guy was a shaker, maker, a doer. Gus Levy was in there 7 o'clock in the morning with two secretaries working with him around the clock. His life was the business. But business wasn't everything. Levy helped build a tradition of charity that continues to this day, pushing Goldman employees toward philanthropic work. His philosophy became the firm's. Gus Levy always said he wants to be long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. Do the right thing by a client and everything will work out. And I think that was the culture of the firm. Takeover mania in America, huge corporations. The early 1980s brought a surge in hostile takeovers. For most investment banks, this was a lucrative new market, too good to pass up. But John Whitehead, a successor to Gus Levy, saw it differently. And it was our observation that the company that had been raided was angry at the company that raided them because the old management all quit and went somewhere else. And it looked to us like unfriendly raids simply didn't work. We decided that Goldman Sachs would not represent uh, acquiring companies that made unfriendly raids. From then on, Goldman was known as Wall Street's white knight, the go-to good guys who defended corporate America. Its new stature brought new clients, new hires, and the beginning of Goldman's notoriously exhaustive interview process. In all of these interviews, they get to know the firm. Edith Cooper is Goldman's global head of human resources. 10, 12, 15 interviews. Interviews. At, at, interviews. Is that typical? Uh, yeah. It is. Uh, if you have people go through an interviewing process, uh, interviewing being done by different personalities, different perspectives, you increase the probability of getting it right. Once Goldman gets it right, each new hire is required to read a document written in the 70s by John Whitehead. I wondered how all these new people that we were hiring, how they could be indoctrinated with the principles of Goldman Sachs, the conduct that we expected from our people. So on a Sunday afternoon and with a yellow pad, I wrote down what turned out to be these principles. The 14 principles would become a roadmap for the company's unmatched success and the success of its employees. When we return, payday at Goldman Sachs. Bob Rubin had a great line that he said to our training classes, your goal is not to get fired that if you can just figure out a way to stay in your seat and do a good job, well, lo and behold, you're going to be rich. That's next when Goldman Sachs Power and Peril continues. The culture of Wall Street has always been a source of popular fascination, in part due to its stratospheric pay a subject of both envy and revulsion. At Goldman Sachs, CEO Lloyd Blankfein took home more than $67 million in total compensation in 2007. In 2009, a year after receiving a $10 billion taxpayer bailout, Goldman paid out a staggering $16 billion to its workforce, almost half a million dollars on average for each of its 32,000 employees. Anthony Scaramucci, a Goldman vice president during the 90s, remembers the advice of then CEO Robert Rubin. Bob Rubin had a great line that he said to our training classes, your goal is not to get fired. This is such a great firm that if you can just figure out a way to stay in your seat and do a good job, well, lo and behold, you're going to be rich. By the time Scaramucci left the firm, he was pulling down $1.5 million a year. But the money didn't come easily. There were relentless hours and high expectations. Now a CNBC contributor and running his own asset management firm, Scaramucci remembers the lengths the bank went to to instill the Goldman work ethic. 
We arrive at the, at the meeting at 5 p.m. It's the Friday before the Memorial Day three-day weekend. And guess what? We are sitting there waiting. A couple guys left. Okay, when the guy showed up at 10 o'clock, five hours late, he passed around an attendance sheet. And he said, you know, the lesson today is about waiting for people that are more important than you. And he said, someday there'll be a billionaire you need to get to. He's going to make you wait in his lobby. Okay, you need to be conditioned for that. And then he got up and he left. And what happened to those new hires who left early? Scaramucci says they were promptly fired. Stories like that only reinforced Goldman's mystique as a tightly knit culture of extraordinarily driven professionals with a guarded approach to outsiders. Day one training, going back to day one, don't talk to the press. That was the number one thing they said to people. A reluctance to open up is still a cornerstone of the Goldman culture, as we discovered in our own dealings with the firm. Goldman Sachs officials agreed to cooperate with us for this report. But the access we were given to the firm turned out to be very limited. Interviews with rank and file employees were off limits, as were most locations inside their building. We weren't allowed to bring our cameras to the firm's trading floor or any public spaces. We weren't even allowed to show you the lobby. We did reach out to dozens of former Goldman employees. Most wouldn't talk to us, and the few who agreed to did so only after first checking with headquarters. Striking evidence of an enduring loyalty built upon Goldman's emphasis on teamwork. Very famous line at Goldman, here's the difference between us and the other firms. We've got six guns, we're all cowboys. We're going to point our guns outside, we're going to shoot outside. Inside these other firms, they got one gun pointed on each other. What made us different was our ability to get along with each other and act collegial. That collegiality stems from a time when Goldman was a tightly knit group of partners whose money and efforts were pooled for their common profit. By the late 1990s, every other major investment bank had chosen to raise billions through a public offering of stock. In 1999, to stay in the game, Goldman followed suit. A big debut expected tomorrow for the Goldman Sachs initial public offering. It was a time of extraordinary change for the bank and its culture. Like the rest of Wall Street, Goldman was also moving away from classic investment banking, financing mergers and advising clients towards trading, both for clients and for itself, in everything from oil to subprime mortgages. Financial historian Neil Ferguson says that increasing appetite for trading had profound implications. The big shift has really been from advising corporations and handling their financing to running what increasingly resembled giant hedge funds. You don't really have clients anymore. You just have people that you trade with. Never mind the relationships. They need us, we need them, it's business. It is Goldman's aggressive trading culture that has recently come under close scrutiny amid accusations of conflicts of interest, claims that it chose one client over another. In 2010, the bank got into deep trouble over an exotic deal with an exotic name, Abacus. Goldman marketed the Abacus deal without telling investors that the securities they were buying were chosen in part by a client who believed those securities would fail. When they did crumble, that client, hedge fund manager John Paulson, netted a billion dollars. Robert Kuzami runs enforcement for the Securities and Exchange Commission. The investors were not told that somebody with an opposite economic interest was involved in selecting the portfolio. The SEC charged Goldman with fraud for not revealing Paulson's role. At the time, Goldman called the charges completely unfounded, and CEO Lloyd Blankfein vowed to fight. Do you continue to maintain, as you did vociferously, uh, when the charges first were made, that you did nothing wrong, that Goldman Sachs had done yes, nothing wrong? Yes, we maintain our belief that on the facts and on the law, uh, we think we were right and acted appropriately. But in the end, while it didn't admit to committing fraud, it did say it had made a mistake and paid an historic penalty, $550 million. The largest penalty assessed against a Wall Street firm or an investment bank in the history of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The Abacus deal is one example of apparent conflicts of interest within the bank. Conflicts Goldman readily concedes. Listen to this conference call between Blankfein and the firm's clients in the spring of 2010. 
you know, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that there are conflicts in this business and the potential for conflicts. And it's not the conflicts, it's how you manage the conflicts that, that, that shows your quality and your, and your character. I think we have been pretty good at it, although there are cases where maybe our judgment is a little bit off, but that's certainly our motivation. When both traditional investment banking and trading take place in the same firm, a bank can not only pick one client over another, according to Neil Ferguson, it can also use its own money to bet against its clients. I don't think once you put everything together under one roof, you can avoid there being major conflicts uh, of interest. There is a massive risk uh, of simply trading against the clients. It would seem to me the modern day investment bank is fraught with conflicts of interest throughout its operations. There are conflicts everywhere. My uh, understanding is that uh, the ethos at Goldman Sachs, the, the watchword, is to embrace these conflicts of interest, uh, uh, to love them. In the end, if conflicts of interest are the friend uh, of the investment banker, uh, you have to wonder who's on the losing side uh, of that particular trade. But Steve Scher, who heads the firm's financing group, defends Goldman's embattled culture. He says the firm holds true to its core principles. The client is still number one. We're not facing off and engaging with our clients to solve their problems with an eye toward where will the firm make its money. The firm does well, but the firm will only do well, and individuals at the firm will only do well as and to the extent that we serve our clients appropriately. Now, I've spoken to many clients of Goldman Sachs, and, and I must tell you, uh, while their regard for the firm is extraordinarily high, they say, you know, I do deal with Goldman Sachs because they have very good people, and I need to deal with Goldman. But I don't necessarily feel that Goldman has my best interests at heart. Goldman is looking out for Goldman. Well, I would take issue with the conclusion you drew about Goldman looking out for Goldman. I think at the end of the day, we will only do well to the extent that we do well by our clients. Uh, that's where it begins and that's where it ends. While Goldman Sachs says its clients have stuck by the firm, the court of public opinion has not. When we return, an American city bruised and battered. It was the complicity of firms like Goldman Sachs that not only ruined neighborhoods that were already struggling in Cleveland, but really wrecked our financial system and did incalculable harm. That's next, when Goldman Sachs Power and Peril continues. Welcome to Cleveland. Hundreds of miles from Wall Street, but at the dead center of the home mortgage crisis that gripped the U.S. during the Great Recession. What you see is a mortgage that's gone bad, a house that got abandoned, and all that's left is the wrecking ball. Tony Brancatelli has seen whole parts of his city fall to ruin. He's a city councilman for Cleveland's Slavic Village, a blighted neighborhood where risky mortgage practices flourished. When I say uh, the name Goldman Sachs to you... It, it scares the hell out of me. These investment groups have created this. These houses got traded like commodities, like gas and or oranges. And Councilman Brancatelli believes Goldman Sachs and other Wall Street banks are guilty of fueling reckless lending here. That lending created a real estate bubble whose implosion leveled whole tracks of this struggling blue-collar neighborhood. We've already demolished about 10,000 properties. That's uh, citywide. City. You said 500, though. In this neighborhood. In your, in this just in this neighborhood. Who do you blame for all of this? Oh, I look directly at Wall Street. When it came to Wall Street, Goldman Sachs was neither the biggest nor the smallest in providing money to lenders, much of which went to subprime borrowers. Councilman, I think Goldman Sachs would say a few things in their defense. We were providing money to the mortgage lenders here on the ground so that people could afford to buy homes. You know, that's an argument that a drug dealer uses when he goes to jail. I was only providing what people were asking for. They were peddling a bad drug, and it was called bad mortgages. And they continued to peddle those bad mortgages. They continued to provide that drug for people who could not afford to pay those mortgages. This is what we're left with. We went with Brancatelli to an abandoned house that has a direct connection to Goldman Sachs. 
Yeah. Goldman bought the mortgage on this home and others around the country from lenders who made the loans. Like other banks, Goldman pooled thousands of these mortgages and sold shares in that pool. The result? An investment called a mortgage-backed security that offered its buyers a steady stream of cash that flowed from homeowners' monthly mortgage payments. The market for mortgage-backed securities exploded. But then the value of homes stopped rising. And borrowers who couldn't refinance or sell their way out of mortgages they couldn't afford were faced with foreclosure. These were $20,000, $30,000 houses, which briefly became $100,000 became houses, right, right, and now right. we're $6,000 yeah, houses. No, less than that. I mean, the average sale price in this neighborhood is around $5,000. Make no mistake about it. This crisis has put this uh, city in this region and this country in many respects flat on its back. County Treasurer Jim Rakakis says there are plenty of people to blame, including homeowners who took on mortgages they couldn't afford. But he says it's Wall Street that bears the largest responsibility for Cleveland's plight. None of this could have happened until people, the size and the power and the strength of Goldman, really entered the fray. But Goldman Sachs would say we were not the biggest offender if we even were an offender. We ultimately were doing what Wall Street's supposed to be doing. We allocated capital where we thought it would be used well. We packaged up the securities. We sold those securities. We continued that capital being able to flow into these communities. What's the problem? They may argue they weren't the worst, but they were certainly very much part of this problem. They knew these companies were putting bad product out on the street. They were too smart not to know that. But the profits were also too large to ignore. We wanted to ask Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein about that charge and other claims made against the firm. But we didn't have the chance. When the time came for a long-promised sit-down interview with him for this documentary, Goldman Sachs reneged. In a written response, Goldman officials told us they did not fuel reckless mortgage lending, insisting we did extensive due diligence on the loans we bought. We did not purchase loans where we knew the borrowers were unable or unlikely to pay. Regardless, the housing bubble kept growing. But just in case it burst, Goldman was prepared. It protected itself by betting against the very mortgage-backed securities that it created and sold to investors in the first place. Goldman had protected itself with an exotic Wall Street invention, similar to an insurance policy, that enabled it to bet that people here in Cleveland and elsewhere wouldn't pay their mortgages back. It was a complex financial creation with a name only a banker could love, a synthetic collateralized debt obligation, or synthetic CDO. If the value of the mortgage is held up, Goldman, like any holder of an insurance policy, would continue to make a steady stream of relatively small payments. But if the mortgage market did collapse, Goldman stood to reap a huge reward. There's something wrong with the system that allows a firm to package and sell mortgages to their investors that they know are iffy and collecting fees on the front end for packaging these mortgages and then betting against it on the other end. That is wrong, and they did it. One of those synthetic CDOs that Goldman offered was a deal called Hudson Mezzanine that got the attention of Senator Carl Levin. The $2 billion Hudson synthetic CDO, a Goldman salesperson described it as junk, not to the buyer, of course, but inside. The CDO imploded within two years. Your clients lost. Goldman profited. Here's how Goldman used its Hudson deal to bet against the mortgages it had sold as investments just months earlier. It started with homes like this at 785 Wayside Road in Cleveland. In 2006, Goldman bought the mortgage on this house, pooled it with others, and created a mortgage-backed security that it offered to customers. This empty lot on Wayside is where that home once stood. It turns out Goldman made two deals that included the mortgage for this home in the same year, the mortgage-backed security and the Hudson Synthetic CDO. In the first, Goldman offered an investment to customers who expected the mortgages would be paid back. In Hudson, Goldman was wagering its own money that the mortgages would not be paid back. That raises the question, was the bank selling investments it assumed would go bad? Goldman insists it was not. Quote, we did not choose securities with the belief they would lose value. 
If investors did not like the underlying securities, they could have chosen not to invest. Craig Broderick heads risk management for Goldman Sachs. The larger takeaway for so many people seems to be that Goldman Sachs knew better than anybody else and gamed the system uh, and knew that the mortgage market was about to collapse and therefore did something that no other firm did. It might uh, enhance my profile as a risk manager if I were able to sit here and say we had great uh, uh, insight into how the market was going to move. Goldman officials say the bank lost money investing in residential mortgages. Further proof, they say, that they didn't expect the housing market to collapse. We merely knew that the market appeared to have more risk inherent in it than we had understood previously. And therefore, the appropriate action was to, uh, was to reduce risk. To reduce its risk, Goldman turned to those Wall Street concoctions, synthetic CDOs. The reason they're called synthetic is because no mortgages are actually bought or sold. A synthetic CDO is simply a wager, a bet on whether mortgages will be paid back. That means Goldman and other banks could create bets on the same mortgages again and again. Along the way, the bad debt just kept multiplying. I want to clear path out the door, please. Clear the door. Whether Goldman gained the system or not, the widespread belief that it did has led many to question its integrity. Head of Human Resources Edith Cooper defends the bank as committed to its core principles. We're very focused on um, not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of that. We pay attention to honesty. Somebody listening to this conversation who's unaffiliated and doesn't know much about Goldman Sachs except what they read in the newspaper would be like, what is this lady talking about? This is Goldman Sachs. They are not honest. They are not doing the right thing. They're betting against the American dream. I feel very uh, strongly about the purpose uh, that Goldman Sachs serves uh, and the principal nature of what we do. Um, I also feel very strongly that we aren't perfect. We need to communicate more directly about what we do. We know that we are an organization that's based on all of the things that are key to our business principles, honesty, integrity, uh, entrepreneurialism, because if we weren't, we would not have support from our clients. But we don't take any of that for granted. We recognize that we have to earn that every day, and we have a lot of work to do to continue to have that type of loyalty. Goldman may also have a lot of work to do to revive the trust of another critical constituency, government. Has the name Goldman Sachs become toxic in Washington, D.C.? It is right now. Coming up, a story of public service, money, influence, and high office. When Goldman Sachs, Power and Peril continues. I don't think there's any other private institution in the United States that's had the impact on domestic policy that Goldman Sachs has had. They're huge. They're the big, bad Leroy Brown of financial influence in Washington, D.C. When it comes to visibility and influence, Goldman Sachs is as noticeable on Pennsylvania Avenue as it is on Wall Street. And its access to Washington power was never more apparent than on July 10, 2006, the swearing-in of Goldman CEO Henry Paulson as Secretary of the Treasury. Today he's showing his character and patriotism by leaving his career to serve our country. It was a gathering of the Goldman clan as another member reached the highest levels of government service. There was Paulson's successor at Goldman, Lloyd Blankfein, former chairman and one-time Bush advisor Stephen Friedman, and White House Chief of Staff Josh Bolton, also a Goldman alum. It was a proud and happy occasion for Goldman Sachs. But just two years later, the smiles would be gone, and Hank Paulson would be in the fight of his life. Nervous investors want to know what's next. J.P. Morgan Chase is buying Bear Stearns at a rock-bottom price. The subprime crisis has been its undoing. Foreclosures up a staggering 87%. Fannie and Freddie under new management, the federal government. 
the financial crisis of 2008. Insurance giant AIG on life support tonight. Lehman Brothers filing for bankruptcy. Merrill Lynch sold to Bank of America. Never thought it would come to this. The system itself on the verge of collapse. A stunning day on the stock market. Stocks fell off a cliff. People are depressed and scared. The president announces an unprecedented bailout plan to save the nation's banks. The federal government would put up to 700 billion taxpayer dollars on the line. This is an urgent matter and we need to move very quickly. At Treasury, Hank Paulson has surrounded himself with a posse of Goldman Sachs alumni. Robert Steele, Neil Kashkari, Kendrick Wilson, Ed Forst, Dan Jester, and Steve Shaffron. Their overwhelming numbers earn them a nickname from the Washington Wags, Government Sachs. I think almost anybody else would have said, okay, I'll bring one or two in, but if I'm going to bring in an army, it's going to look bad. University of Maryland law professor Michael Greenberger is a former director at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The bailout was going to take great imagination and diversity of views, and bringing people who come from the same mindset was a terrible mistake. But they are amongst the best and the brightest. They have a long history of serving in government. And to Paulson's defense, who else are you going to go to when you're trying to figure things out? I think that question, with all respect to you, is revealing of a very narrow, shallow view of the financial world. There are many people in the United States who are very familiar with financial markets who happen not to work at Wall Street. Former Goldman chairman John Corzine, who went on to serve in the U.S. Senate and as governor of New Jersey, says Paulson should get the benefit of the doubt. When you have to make the toughest decisions in your life, it's nice to have people around that you trust. Should Paulson have been more aware of public perception when he hired all those guys from Goldman? I, I think in 2020 hindsight, a lot of things are um, easier to recognize. But concern over the extent of Goldman's influence deepened after insurance company AIG survived the crisis with a taxpayer bailout that eventually reached $183 billion. That allowed AIG to repay a $13 billion debt to Goldman, one of many banks that were paid out in full on the money owed them by AIG. That whole episode is very, very questionable. Why let Lehman fail one day and then rescue AIG the other day? Was it because Goldman needed the $13 billion that AIG was a counterparty for? A lot of people believe it was the influence and the concern uh, for Goldman. Henry Paulson wouldn't speak to us for this report, but a spokesman for Goldman Sachs says the firm exerted no influence in the AIG bailout and Paulson defended himself before Congress in 2009. I left Goldman Sachs. I sold my shares in Goldman Sachs. Uh, I operated very consistently with the, in the ethic guidelines I had as Secretary of the Treasury. Old Goldman hands like former Chairman John Whitehead, who himself left for the number two job in Ronald Reagan's State Department, bristle at suggestions of a Goldman conspiracy. It's very discouraging to me that to have people volunteer for public service, that it's seen by some to be a sort of an insidious desire to take over control of Washington, which is ridiculous. Before joining our administration, Bob built a brilliant career at Goldman Sachs and Company. Former Goldman Chair Robert Rubin's tenure as economic advisor and then Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration came during a time of unprecedented growth. The national motto might be, let the good times roll. It's a day for the record books on Wall Street. 819 points in just two days. Once hailed as an economic savior, Rubin has come under fire over his support for financial deregulation that some say favored Wall Street and his former colleagues at Goldman. Now, it's time to reform Glass-Steagall. Critics say the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act encouraged some banks to pursue more profitable and riskier lines of business. They also fault Rubin for not pushing more aggressively for regulation of complex financial instruments that helped trigger the 2008 financial crisis. Mr. Rubin, looking at the big... That issue was put to him by a government commission investigating the crisis. You've said in the past that there was no political will <laughs> to regulate over-the-counter derivatives. Was the lack of 
political will related to pressure by the financial services industry? I think there were very strongly held views in the financial services industry in opposition to regulation, and I think that they were not surmountable at that point. In Washington, political will, or lack thereof, is more often than not directly tied to money. And when it comes to Goldman Sachs, there's always plenty of that to go around. Their PAC and their executives have spent $32 million in campaign contributions uh, in the past 20 years. Nick Nyhart runs Public Campaign, a campaign finance reform group. The financial sector as a whole is the most powerful giving sector, but they're the top giver within the financial sector uh, to candidates and, and incumbents in Congress. But in election year 2010, candidates were less eager to take Goldman's money. Has the name Goldman Sachs become toxic in Washington, D.C.? It is right now. Any association with Goldman Sachs was seen as such a liability that almost two dozen candidates, including Arkansas Senator Blanche Lincoln, refused Goldman campaign contributions or donated them to charity. We never had a fundraiser with Goldman. We said we wouldn't raise any more money from them. We wouldn't take any more money from them. Goldman Sachs, you're the worst. Time to put the people first. Are we going to see Goldman lose clout in Washington, D.C. over an extended period of time? If I had to bet, the answer to that is yes, they're going to lose clout. Who got the money, money, they got the money, money. I think they've lost their brand. Their brand was phenomenal. I think their brand is now a liability rather than an asset. Money, money, we got the bill. To counter months of negative publicity, Goldman went on the offensive, unveiling a national ad campaign to bolster its image. But the question remains, does it really matter what the public thinks? Goldman Sachs is about one thing, money. When we come back, the conclusion of Goldman Sachs, power and peril. In Goldman Sachs's storied history, 2010 will go down as one of its harshest years. But while its reputation has been dealt a severe blow, its ability to produce profits remains undiminished. The court of public opinion may drive headlines, but the opinion that really matters to Goldman Sachs and its bottom line is that of its clients. So far, the loyalty of Goldman's clients endures. But given the changing nature of Goldman's business, with its focus on trading rather than banking relationships, the most important client to Goldman now and in the future is not some corporation or hedge fund. Goldman's number one client is Goldman. I'm David Faber. Thanks for watching.